I'm going to talk today about Phoenix. And if you don't know uh, what Phoenix is, it's basically the web framework that is built on the Elixir programming language. So if you're familiar with like Rails is to Ruby, kind of Phoenix is to Elixir. And specifically, while Phoenix provides some awesome things for web applications on its own, about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe two years ago at this point, who knows after all this COVID stuff what a year is, but uh, some time ago they released LiveView um, and it's grown in its capabilities and potential since then. And I'd like to demonstrate some of those things to you today. They're really cool. It provides real-time HTML communication from the server to the client. And it requires you to write like little to no JavaScript. You can put some JavaScript in there if you want, but if you don't want to touch JavaScript, you don't have to. And it's efficient, performant, and real time and distributed, which is really cool. So here's what we're doing today. This is kind of our, our plan. Uh, the first thing is I'm going to go over uh, some of LiveView's benefits, just basically bullet point things that some of them I stole straight from the Phoenix LiveView readme. Some of them um, I kind of modified a little bit to my taste. And then we're just going to jump right into code and actually change a traditional controller driven uh, web application into a real-time one using Phoenix Live View. And uh, there will be some errors. Some of them are going to be on purpose. Some of them, I'm sure, will not be on purpose. So bear with me. Live coding is always fun and adventurous. Uh, it makes me feel alive up here in front of you. Um, so we'll see if we can get through it uh, on time and without many errors. So Phoenix Live View, what are some of the benefits? I asked, um, well, let's go back to that first slide. I asked one of my buddies. I said, I'm doing this talk. What's something that you think that these people should know about Phoenix Live View? And he's worked as a consultant on a lot of different applications and utilizes Phoenix in a lot of those now um, and has a few different applications on production that use Phoenix Live View, especially for things like form validations. And um, he says, the main thing that I love about it is it just works. Um, so that's why I put format server rendered HTML that actually works. So that's, that's for him. That's for Ian. Uh, but it's true that it actually works. Um, there are some other uh, communication protocols out there or web framework plugins that you can use um, that do somewhat similar things, but the, well, I'll get to this in the bullet points. Okay. So here's what Phoenix Live View does. You can push HTML from the server to the client over WebSockets. And again, there's other things that do that, but Elixir gives us an edge. In the case of Phoenix Live View, we send only what changed to the client. And that means if no markup on the change page, then you're not going to get HTML markup, HTML markup sent as a message to the client over that socket connection. So not only does that save you in terms of bandwidth, but it also saves, of course, in, in download time to the user um, and processing time on the server to generate that markup. It also allows you to um, hook into JavaScript events if you want. Um, and also provide form uh, hooks as well. So things like live form validations, um, I'm sure we've all encountered a form where there's this like, super complex uh, thing you're supposed to match your email address or password for, like a, a pattern that you have to, um, to be in. You basically have to use this pattern to create your password, but you don't know what it is until you hit enter. You come up with your password and you're all clever and then you hit enter and then the form re-renders and says, no, sorry, we can't accept that password. It actually needs these you know, seven things to be true about it before we can accept your password. And why didn't you tell me that before? Well, the cool thing about Phoenix Live View is you can do uh, real-time form validations and um, provide instant feedback to users as they're filling out forms, including file uploads, which is pretty neat. It also allows you to do reusable HTML components um, that again are on the server side and each one of those can have their own state. They can house their own state and information. That means that anywhere on the page, um, and we'll go over this a little bit more of this uh, later, but each page that is rendered in Phoenix has its own web, uh, WebSocket connection and is handled in a process, a lightweight Elixir process on the server. That means that if any little part of your web page breaks or crashes, then it's not going to take down the rest of your website and hopefully, or even that web page and hopefully not your website and, you know, God forbid your whole web server. So each one of those has its own self-healing state that you can provide um, that is apart from every other component on your web page. It also provides live navigation. As I mentioned, it doesn't provide markup over the wire unless it requires it. So things like live navigation, you know, if you think about a website, typically there's like a, a, an outer template that um, has like logo and branding and login information and navigation, things like that. Most of that stays the same um, on every page you visit. So if you don't have to, you know, render that HTML and send it down to the client on every page load, then that can save, again, not only a lot of bandwidth, but it can save on user navigation time and uh, server time as well. So um, live navigation is really cool. In fact, I've got a, a web application that I'm working on with a buddy that um, it's basically kind of a, like a live note taking application. We do a lot of live view in there. 
Um, and the navigation in it is so fast. I told him it, it feels fake. It feels like it's like, um, I don't know. It, it feels like I'm doing something that's faking it, but I'm not. And it's even running on like the smallest digital ocean droplet. I mean, it is um, super, super quick. Uh, so beyond that, because it uses Elixir and Elixir is built on Erlang and Erlang compiles down to uh, Beam VM, uh, it is distributed in real time out of the box. You don't have to do anything extra to, to do some really cool distributed in real time things with Elixir and Phoenix Live View. And of course, my favorite things are it's built on Elixir and Phoenix, um, which are two things I highly encourage everyone to take a look at and, and use. Um, I got into Rails back in 2004, I think it was, um, when I first saw, maybe it was 2005, but when I first saw David Hennemeyer Hansen's, you know, build a blog in 10 minutes screencast, I was like, okay, I'm never writing in PHP again. And that was true. I, I basically never wrote in PHP again. I was always doing Rails. Um, and the same thing happened back in 2014 when I saw Elixir. I was like, oh man, if I, if I had my choice, I probably wouldn't write in Ruby again. I would, I would move to Elixir. Um, so it's a fun language to write in. And Phoenix does some really cool things in the web. So those are the bullet points. Um, and the meat of the talk is really just going to be us diving into code and seeing how things work. So that's enough talk. Let me load up here um, our web application and show you what we're dealing with. All right, so on my screen, on the right-hand side here, you'll see we have our web application in the browser. And you can kind of think of the, the thing we're providing is our users, we're providing our users with uh, real-time um, stock updates. Well, we'd like for it to be real-time stock updates. Right now, they're just static. Um, you can see we have the, the, uh, the name of the company, we have their tickle, ticker symbol, um, and we have the latest price that we have for that company. Now, if I refresh the page, then it does give me new prices. And this is kind of typically how a normal traditional web application would work. And, you know, if I want new information, I have to request it. I have to hit that refresh button um, and it'll give me the latest prices. Now, one thing I want to mention before we go any further is these are real names of companies. Um, they are real ticker symbols, but they're not real prices. Um, I've just got a, a back-end process that every two seconds randomly updates the, the, the prices. And if you're interested, it is a bull market. About 60% of the time, the price goes up and about 40% of the time, price goes down. So if you want to you know, buy now, then this is the good time to buy. But again, don't, don't buy anything for real. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you'll see the output, the console output of Phoenix. And so you can see that uh, this request that I just uh, made in our web browser was handled by a page controller and an index function. And as you might guess, in most web frameworks, you know, you typically hit something like an index on a page or on a controller. And so we can look at that code, and this is what a page controller would look like in Elixir, a traditional one. So it uses a controller, and we've got the, the index function defined. That index accepts a connection and a list of params, um, even though we don't care about the params in this case. And we call this render function. We're rendering to the connection an index.html template. And in that template, we're providing a variable called companies. And we're in that, uh, for those companies, we're just iterating through and, and listing out a, a row for each of those. Now, one thing you might want to know in terms of terminology is this variable that we're providing to the template is called an assign in uh, the Phoenix world, probably in some other frameworks as well. But here we're, it's called an assign. And that'll come up here uh, in a minute. That'll be important. The other thing I want to show you is our router. Um, so in here, this is where we handle how requests are routed. You know, where does request A go? Where does request B go? So on our initial scope here, this is saying for any root um, request, it's gonna be handled within the go to Chicago web namespace. And then within there, uh, any request to, again, the root path is gonna be handled by page controller index. And again, that kind of, we've, we've seen how that plays out in both the, the logger, or sorry, in the logs and on the web page here. Um, and this pipe through, you can provide different pipes, different pipelines that each request goes through, which again is a huge thing in Elixir or Phoenix that I love. Um, you can uh, customize how each request is handled and, and what little pieces it goes through as it, as it handles that connection. That's a little out of scope for this, uh, this, top, this presentation, but it's something that's very cool that you can take a look at on your own. So the first thing we want to do, let's, let's say we, we like this application, it's working well, you know, our users are loving that we've got these up-to-date prices, but they have to manually refresh it. So what if we say, well, let's, let's push out new updates to the users whenever we get an update on the price so that they can always have that latest price and they can try to beat those, those darn trading bots. Um, so let's, let's aim for that. Uh, the first thing we need to do is instead of being handled by a traditional page controller, 
we need to push the request through a live view, through live view itself. Um, and so instead of handling, excuse me, get request at that path, we're going to say it's going to be a live request. And instead of through page controller, let's handle it in a module we're going to call page live. Now, if you look on the right here, if I refresh this, it's going to fail because we don't have that defined. We haven't defined page live, that module. So that's the first thing we need to do. So let's go and find that. And by tra tradition or um, idiomatically, uh, live, con live, uh, live view stuff is usually contained within a live directory. So we'll call this page live.ex. And uh, we're going to define module. And it's go to Chicago web page live. And it's going to use Phoenix Live View. And I'm just going to end it there, save that, and show you another error message. Um, on the right, I didn't refresh that page. One of the cool things about Phoenix is it's super quick and uh, about noticing changes on the file system and re-rendering the web connection uh, in your browser when that uh, connection, when the file system changes. So it recognized, hey, now this page live is defined. So it refreshed itself and now we've got a new error. And that error is that render one was not implemented. Now, if you're not familiar with Elixir so much, then um, the render slash one basically means there's a render function and the one means there's one argument to be expected in that render function. So let's define that. So let's define render. Um, I mentioned earlier that assigns is gonna come into play in a little bit. This is where we're gonna start seeing assigns being a thing. In this case, we're not gonna care about it, um, but the render function accepts the, the assigns, but right now we're just gonna ignore it. Instead, we're just gonna say, you know what? We're going to get the list of companies from the database, Chicago uh, list companies. And then we're going to um, render the page that we were rendering before. Should we do Chicago web dot page uh, view dot render. And again, we're going to render it in as the index.html template. And we're going to pass in the assigned companies as companies. Save that. On the right hand side, we should get a new error here. And do we indeed we do? It's uh, assigned companies not available. That's because I misspelled it. Again, helpful error messages. Instead of come monies, we want uh, not command piece, companies. There we go. Let me save that. Now I should uh, realize that yes, we do have the companies in the assigns now. Now we have a new problem. But again, this one's pretty simple to fix. Um, so ensure your render function uses tilde L or your EEX template uses the dot L EEX extension. Um, in Phoenix Live View, you can actually uh, render um, HTML and the component like this, just in, in line, just say, hey, this is gonna be what I want, and you know, put some HTML in here, um, and you know, whatever. We're not gonna do it that way. We've got the index um, template already defined, but the .eex extension, it basically tells um, Phoenix that it is a static uh, Elixir template, and if we prefix, or if we made it a .leex extension, that just means it's a live view template. So all we need to do is rename this file, um, from index.html.eex to index.html.leex. We save that. And now on the right, you see that the browser again refreshes itself and we are back to having a live application. But again, it's still not real time. We do have to um, refresh the page to get those new updates, um, which are updating two times, or sorry, every two seconds. Um, so I have to still request it on my own. But if you see in our, uh, on our log here, the, the server logs, the request is now being handled by our go to Chicago web page live uh, module. So at least we're now going through what uh, live view provides us. One thing I should mention, and I kind of forgot to mention at the beginning of this is that there is one step that was before this that I kind of glossed over, um, but isn't really that big of a deal. So I created this Phoenix application through the generator through just a Phoenix generator um, to not be a live view application. Um, that's because I wanted to go through the steps of converting it to live view myself. But in order to convert it to live view, there were just some boilerplate things. All I had to do was copy and paste things from the readme that Phoenix live view provides. And um, at most there's like five lines per file, maybe, you know, seven different files you need to touch. Um, so really not much at all, but out of, you know, for time's sake, I just kind of already did that, even though I wasn't using, utilizing any of live views capabilities. If you're interested in what those steps are, um, then at the end of the presentation, I've got a link to the exact code that I'm using right now. And uh, I've got, into each individual commit, all the different steps we're going to be taking today. And uh, you can see how each of those play out. 
And furthermore, if you do know from the very beginning that you would like a live view application, then Phoenix actually provides live view generators. So if you create a website, you can just pass in the you know, dash dash live and it'll be live view uh, capable from the start, which is pretty cool. All right, so we are utilizing live view now to handle the requests, but it's still not real time. So if you think about what it's gonna take uh, to have real time communications with our server, um, I had mentioned earlier that each web connection, each client connection to our server is handled in a process on the Elixir backend. And that process, um, we want to be able to keep the state of the information we need to, to render the page in that state, in memory. If we go back to page live here, this unit use Phoenix Live View, it provides us some kind of boilerplate or usual um, definitions of functions that we don't, we don't need to redefine if we don't have to, um, but if we need to, we can easily redefine them. Mount is one of those. So um, mount basically is called whenever the user first requests the page and wants to mount, mount the page. Um, so for mount, we kind of want to override this, and I'll show you why in a second, but it's past a list of params, it's past the session information in case you need to do any sort of authentication, even though honestly authentication probably would have be done, would be done before it even hits this point. Um, but in here, if you're, again, if you're familiar with Elixir, you'll notice that um, a lot of times you'll have these tuples as returns, um, okay, or error, or things like that. Uh, so a lot of the Phoenix Live View um, views expect a tuple like this as to the, uh, the response that it, it provides, in this case, okay, and then some information that needs to continue on. And typically, it's the socket itself. So again, if you remember, that process is handling that socket in Elixir process. And so every request it makes, it's gonna, we're going to take in that socket, do something with it, maybe change a couple things, and then return that socket back as the new state of that socket, which is pretty cool. So again, if I save this, nothing should change on the right. Things are still going to be handled. I've got to you know, actually request the new information. But one of the things that we did here that is a little bit more on the traditional sense is we're getting the list of companies on render. Instead, let's get to the list of companies when the page itself is mounted. Um, and assign that list of companies into the socket itself. Not a sing, assign. Uh, so we're going to assign to the socket companies, and companies is going to be that. Make sure I spell everything right this time. Um, and when that is passed on to render, so the thing that comes from mount is kind of passed on to render, and render accepts the list of assigns from the socket. So now we do care about the assigns because we want to pass on the assigns to the template. And let's just pass them all through and not worry about what's actually in there. So again, let's make sure our page is reloading correctly. We did see it reload on its own just because it noticed, noticed the change, but I do have to manually reload and things are still working. But instead of um, getting a list of companies on render, now we get it on mount. And right now, that doesn't make that much of a difference. I mean, honestly, because we have to re-render and remount the page when we want when we reload the, the page. But it will make a difference here in a minute. So we want to do that. Now, um, I mentioned that we've got um, <clears throat> excuse me, something in the background that's updating the prices every two seconds. And that's really a kind of a fake database. I've just got like in-memory information for this list of companies. And uh, every two seconds, that price is updated. So what do we need? to allow this to be real time. Well, we want to, every time a price is updated, we want our web view to be updated, our, our web page to be updated for the user. So I've also created that kind of fake database to be sort of a pub sub mechanism, a publish subscribe. So if you subscribe to this database's updates, then every time a company is updated, it'll send out a message to all the subscribers that, hey, it says, hey, I've got a new list of prices and here's the, the companies that are, that are updated. Um, do what you need to with them. You, you said you wanted them, so here they are. Um, so I've got that already coded. So all we need to do is subscribe to those messages. So in here, um, we can say, you know, if connected, so if the client has connected or the socket has connected successfully, then we want to subscribe. And I have this subscribe function already set up. And uh, this, the, the argument that it expects is the process of who is subscribing. In this case, um, I mentioned that each connection to a web, you know, page and server is handled by um, a process and we want to pass in our, ourselves as the process uh, to subscribe to these messages. I'm going to save this. Now watch on the right hand side. I've got, you know, no hand, look, ma, no hands. You'll notice that we have updating prices and roughly every two seconds we have that list of new prices coming through. 
And so you might think, sweet, we did it. You know, that's exactly what we wanted to do. Um, our work here is done. We can go to the quiz night and win all these prizes. But then we look in the logs and realize that is a heck of a lot of red. And usually red in logs is not a good thing. Um, so you're like, oh, shoot, why, why are we getting these errors? And furthermore, why are errors resulting in the thing we wanted to see, the outcome we wanted? Well, that's another cool thing about Phoenix. Um, Phoenix has a self-healing mechanism to where if the process dies for whatever reason, whether it's an error or you kill it or, you know, the user kills it or, or whatever, then Phoenix will kind of self-heal and say, what was the last known good state I had for this connection? And in this case, it was when the user mounted the page. So it will remount on its own. And when it remounts, we've got the companies now in that mount uh, function. So it gets a list of companies and remounts the page and provides that to the page, to the user. You also notice this isn't like a hard refresh. This is actually, actually is using um, some of uh, Phoenix Live Views capabilities to do some, some cool stuff in here. But you know, having all these errors in your logs isn't the, the right way to go. So let's handle the message. I'm going to um, go over here in my, uh, in the console and actually look at the message itself. So here it is. It says function go to Chicago web dot page live dot handle info slash two is undefined or private. And then it shows you the exact message that was being sent to our process that wasn't handled. And that was page live dot handle info and then new prices in a tuple and then a list of companies. Um, so let's handle that. Let's define that handle info function and, and go from there. And again, if you're familiar with Elixir, this handle info um, should be familiar to you. Gen servers use it, some other processes use it. And typically when a process um, receives a message, um, especially in a gen server, this is how it receives it. Other cool thing about Elixir is it does pattern matching. So we can say, we only wanna handle the specific um, message of new prices and then the list of companies. Uh, and we always get passed in the socket connection. And so, we're not going to send a reply to the sender of the message, which in this case was our fake database. Um, and instead, what we want to do is take our socket and assign the list of companies to the companies variable in the assigns. Um, so I'm going to save that. And back on the right-hand side here, um, we are getting live updates every two seconds. And if we check our logs, now we have no red coming up which is exactly what we wanted. So we are handling that message from our pub sub correctly. It's handling the message in the in page live and then sending it on to the browser. And again, it's doing that efficiently and with as few changes as possible, which is really cool. All right, so a lot of times when you hear about um, functionality like this, the it's kind of like the go, the to-do app. You know, everyone's, when they show off a new technology, they, they make a to-do app. Well, the real time, I think the real time version of a to-do app is chat or, you know, real-time comments. So shoot, let's add that. You know, we did this pretty quickly. What if we added live chat? I do have um, already prepared uh, some of the HTML markup for that live chat. Most of that, you'll notice most of the stuff I do is, um, you know, just me typing stuff in. But in this case, there's a lot of HTML here. I don't want to mess that up. So got these comments and a couple things I want to point out. It's mostly just, you know, standard HTML. But like in most frameworks, Phoenix provides a form builder uh, helper methods or helper functions. In this case, we're calling form for comments. And so our name, the name of our form is going to be comments. And then here is the path that the form should submit to. And another cool thing about Phoenix Live View is you think, well, this is being handled through a JavaScript WebSocket connection. What if the user doesn't have JavaScript enabled in their browser? You know, it might be kind of rare these days for that to happen, but it, it, it's not out of the question. So there's are actually um, uh, easy fallbacks that Phoenix Live View can fall back on and utilize. Um, in this case, we don't really care about the fallbacks. So we're just putting an, an asterisk there, not an asterisk, a hashtag. But we also have this Phoenix hook um, that I mentioned earlier that were available. In this case, we want to say when, uh, the, when the form is submitted, we want to send a message called submit comment to the process. And so that's going to be important here in a minute, um, the submit comment name. After this, you'll see we just have a simple text input. And then just like we do with the companies, we're iterating over the list of comments in the assigns. And again, the assigns are going to show up here with the uh, at symbol in front of it. So we're going to say for each comment in the comments assigned, we're going to loose, loop over and just you know print out the comment text. Nothing, nothing super crazy. I save that. We get an error on the right that says, you know what? I don't know what the comments is supposed to be in our assigns. And that's true. We haven't told um, our... Uh, page live anything about 
the signs comments. So let's add that in there. So comments equals, and as you might expect, I've already prepared a list comments function to get those from our fake database. And then we also want to make sure we pass in those comments to our list of assigns to that socket or for that socket connection. So I hit save. Phoenix Live realizes that, hey, we've got new information. I need to reload myself. And we do indeed have a comments form and someone has already put in the comment first. So perfect. So and we want to be second. So let's go over here and put second. Hit enter. You'll notice it kind of pauses for a second and um, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't do anything. Uh, but then goes on its merry way again of updating the prices. Um, so what's going on? Well, let's check our logs. And yet again, we have a, a, an error message. Um, in this case, we, we have a handle event being sent to the, the server or our process or page live. Um, and that's undefined. And again, just like before, it's self-healing. It knows that the last known good connection was um, on that initial mount. So it mounts it, remounts it and goes on its merry way, which is updating those prices, which is pretty cool. So, but we do want to handle that event of this, of comment being submitted. So let's define that. Uh, so down here we say def handle event and the event was submit comments. Remember that was the, the hook we told it it was gonna be called. Um, within there, it passes in the params uh, and we named the form comments. And just like in JavaScript, you can destructure um, objects and things like that. In this case, it's a map or destructuring a map um, within the function definition itself. And within that comments form, we had um, a form or a field called text, and we'll just bind that to the text variable here for this function. And of course, we have the socket being passed through as well. Um, so go to Chicago web, this is our fake database, or go to Chicago, we're going to insert that comment, uh, that comment text, and then we're not gonna reply to the um, sender of the message, but instead we're going to assign socket, and then our comments is now going to equal uh, just go and get all the comments again. So list comments. Uh, and that's going to be our new comments. Save that. We'll go over here and we'll try now submitting a comment. Second, you know, third, perfect. So now we have, you know, live chat, live capability for entering comments. And those messages are being handled as asynchronously from all the messages for live updating of the prices, which is pretty neat. Um, so what if we, you know, live chat itself is not very fun with just one person. So let's open up another browser here um, and say, okay, well, this guy is the fourth person. Well, he puts in fourth, but over on the right here, we don't get fourth as an update. Why is that? Well, the reason is because, and you might have guessed this if you um, were really paying attention about the, the messages of the, uh, the prices, we're not sending out messages. The, the, the pub sub isn't sending out a message on a new comment. And I've done this. Um, this is the one thing I haven't done beforehand. Just so I can show you a peek a little bit about how we would do that in our pub sub. Um, so I have something called fake repo. That's kind of a fake database. It is a gin server if you speak Elixir. Um, and then here in this insert comment, this is where we basically handle the insert comments uh, function. So in our state, we have a list of subscribers. Uh, so for each one of those, we want to go through and take a subscriber, subscriber, and uh, we want to send that subscriber a message, and um, make sure I spell that right. And the message we want it to to receive is something called "How about new comments?" and just pass that comment that it received back through. Save that. Uh, and let's go back over to our web browsers. And over here, I refresh the page. You can see we have fourth there when I manually refresh it. But what if I now type fifth over here? So yes, we have fifth on the right, and now we have fifth on the left. So you might think, perfect. But you also might think, wait a minute, something was a little fishy there. So I'm gonna press enter and watch how long it takes for that left-hand side to get the message. So enter. Ooh, that's a bit of a delay. So something might be up there, right? Well, let's go check our logs. And uh, again, we have a whole bunch of red. And that's because we are sending that message to the subscribers, but we're not handling that message in our page live. That's easy enough to do. We've done that before um, with our new prices. So we want to define another function of handle info, again, using pattern matching of new comments. And we sent that comment along with it as well. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the socket is always sent along as well. Um, so here we don't want to reply to the fake database. Instead, we want to assign the socket, uh, the comments, and now I'm going to do something that's going to look a little weird at first, but I'll explain why in a minute. So instead of saying all the comments, like down here, when we submit the comments, um, we are going through and getting all the comments again from the database. 
and putting them back into the, the socket connection. And um, while that works now, when we're just kind of doing stuff locally, like what if, what if we had, you know, a hundred users or what if, what if we got really big and now we're Robin hood and we've got, you know, a million users or 10 million users and they're all chatting on this page. And um, how can we handle all that in, in a memory process? I mentioned that all this, these processes are held in memory. That's a lot of data to held in memory if we're getting everything from the database. Well, that's where something called temporary assigns comes in that Phoenix Live View provides. It already thought of that. It, you know, Chris McCord, who is the guy who came up with Phoenix Live View and Phoenix itself, uh, he's a smart guy. He knows that if we have this type of application, you're not going to want to hold all that information in memory. So we have something called temporary assigns. So um, on our handle event, when that um, uh, comment is submitted, instead of assigning the socket and going out and getting the database information, let's just say, you know, we're not going to handle it explicitly here. We're just going to pass on the socket as we found it. So instead of doing anything to the socket, we're just going to pass it along and trust that, um, that we, in their knowledge that the database itself is going to send out a message saying, Hey, we've got a new comment here, do what you want to with it. And this is where we want, where we do what we want to with it. Now, um, temporary signs, let me set that up. Uh, go up here and in our original uh, socket return and our assign, we can tell it, you know, of these assigns, we do have some temporary assigns that you need to know about. And one of those is comments. And uh, this little empty list is what tells the temporary assigns mechanism what to reset the assigns to after it's done with them. Um, so if you think about, think about it like this, as soon as um, our original, like we've, we've mounted the web page, mounted the web socket, that's passed it on to render. Renders takes that uh, comments assign and um, on the right hand side here in our, in our uh, browser, it goes through and it renders all these comments. And now it's done with it. It knows I've done what I need to with this assign. Um, and usually it would just keep it in memory. But now with this temporary assigns, it's saying, okay, I'm going to throw everything away that I have in memory for this assign and reset it to this state of an empty list. Now down here, this might make a little more sense again to where now we've said that comments assigned should be a list again but in this case, just with the new comment that we received. I'm going to save that and um, go over here and try something again. Let's, uh, you know, do seventh. And we do get um, the message. And in fact, if we bring up the other uh, page over here, if I type ninth over on this side, you should see that now both browsers say ninth, but all our other comments are gone. Um, and you probably rightly guessed, but that's because we're replacing all the comments in the memory with this one comment, our latest comment. And of course, Phoenix Live View does provide a way to handle that as well, as you might have guessed. So we go back to our index.html. And um, this is where we're, we're doing stuff with that comments assigned, right? We're iterating through it and, and um, listing out each one's text. Well, Phoenix knows that this is the spot in your web page that you do stuff with that assign. And it has something called Phoenix Update. And you can put that in here. And by default, it's doing this thing called replace. It's doing an option called replace. Um, that means that it's going to replace this whole interior div every time it realizes that comments has changed. And since it does that whole replace, it's replacing this whole comments area over here with what's in now the new comments assign. Um, but instead of replace, we know that's a temporary assign, but we just want to prepend that area with the information instead of replace it. So let me refresh these manually just to get our list of assigns back or list our comments. And now I've pressed 10th. Uh, that's pretty quick. Now both browsers are getting the update. Um, go back over here, uh, type 12th over here. Both browsers are getting those just fine very quickly. And um, we check on our logs, no errors. So we've done it. We've created real-time chat. And again, you know, we can add, open up a whole another um, browser window and they can join in the chat. Um, and all of them are in sync and up to date and get those messages very quickly and in real time, which is awesome. So th this mission accomplished there. Um, so honestly, that's what we're going to be doing. That's all we're doing in terms of adding functionality to this website. But when I do things like this, um, I like to wonder, you know, how far can I push things with Elixir? How, how far can I push things with Phoenix as well? Um, so when I was thinking about thinking through this, I was like, well, <clears throat> the thing that it does well um, is these live updates. So I've got it running every two seconds as an update. Well, what if I, you know, can I push that even further? So let's go back to our page, uh, sorry, our fake repo, which is our pub sub as well. Um, and in here, I've got this function that all it's doing is passing on an update milliseconds. And you wouldn't normally do things like this, but I've done it this way for demonstration purposes. And here we have 2000 milliseconds is our update tick. And um, what if we increase that 
to, let's say, one second. Now, it might seem kind of silly, but I'm actually going to restart the server. You don't have to, but it's going to save me typing, actually, and it's restarts so quickly that it's, it's easy to do. Um, so back to our browser. Excuse me. We can see that now both browsers are updating in one second. Every one second, they, they're updating, and both of them are in sync and doing things well. Uh, so that's great. Um, so I thought, well, let's see if we can go even further. How about every half a second? Do that, save it. Um, this time I'm going to kill the server and show you how, uh, show you something else. So you'll notice that our browsers now are, they're not updating anymore, which is good because there's not a server to talk to. But it's another one of those self-healing things that Elixir has, or and Phoenix has, is it, it knows the server went away, but it's going to keep saying, hey, I know you were there. Are you there yet? Are you there again? Are you back? Uh, can I communicate with you yet? Um, you know, knock, knock, open up, whatever, it, whatever you call it, it's going to keep checking to see if that server exists and then re-communicate with it. So I'm going to start the server back up. You'll notice I'm not going to press anything, but as soon as it starts up, Phoenix is going to realize, hey, you know what, that server's back and it's going to reconnect and we have updating prices again, this time every half a second. So 500 milliseconds, we have a, a push update to our browser in real time. Uh, let's go even further. How about I don't know, 200 milliseconds? So five times a second. Let's try that, uh, not P. Let's do our server. Again, it's going to recompile that real quickly and then back to our browser. And we've got uh, every five seconds, we've got updates to our browser for all these prices. Um, and as you'd imagine, you know, we still have um, asynchronous messaging as well for uh, comments, um, which is pretty cool. And then I did this uh, a, a very truncated version of this talk one time and someone in the audience yelled out when we can meet in real person, real life. They were like, well, what about 60 frames a second? And I thought, well, that's, you know, you laugh, but let's try it. So 16, 60 frames per second is basically 16 milliseconds. So let's restart the server, which restarts that timer and see what we can do. In this case, Zoom might actually be the, um, the contributing factor of not being able to do 60 frames a second. But uh, on my browsers, these are updating very quickly um, and handling that very well. Um, I have read, let this run for a while and it just starts eating up a ton of memory. So I'm actually going to uh, kill that because the browsers aren't very good at handling it and change it instead back to, let's say, 200. So five times a second. Reshut the server um, and Phoenix is going to reconnect and go from there. And a bird is trying to get into my house right now. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so we have five times a second the server is sending these messages out and our, our browser is handling them. Now, um, I actually haven't been completely upfront with what we're rendering here. It looks like that we're rendering, I don't know what, like 15 to 20 different um, companies. And, you know, five times a second, those, let's say it's 20. So five times a second, 20 different companies. Um, that is what, 100 different browser changes every minute, or sorry, every second. It's actually more than that. So if you look, this is actually the full S&P 500 list of all those companies in the S&P 500 and prices are being updated for every one of them every 200 milliseconds and being pushed out to the browser as new information over a WebSocket connection. And the only reason they can do this so efficiently is because of those, uh, the diffing algorithm that Phoenix uses to know that only the things that changed need to be pushed out, no markup, um, nothing like that. So it's really just updating each row with information. Um, and you know, you see it's, it's still smooth scrolling and a lot of this is Vivaldi as a browser. Um, and uh, each browser may handle you know, lots of information differently, but 200, every 200 milliseconds to 500 companies, what is that? Uh, five times, 2,500 updates a second to our browser that's being handled in real time. And our chat still works and it's performant and real time and distributed. That's pretty cool. So that's Phoenix. That's what I wanted to show you today. Um, I actually wrote a book um, called Phoenix in Action. Um, it goes through a lot of Phoenix. It doesn't actually go through LiveView. LiveView was still a baby when Phoenix in Action went, went to print. And, um, but it does give you enough information to get to the point where you're ready to use LiveView in your application. You really should have some fundamentals behind your back before you get into it. Um, Manning did give me a discount code to give out uh, at the conference. So there's a discount code here for 35% off any, anything at Manning, not just my book. Um, but if you have any questions or want to get in touch with me, of course, I'll be here in the Slack uh, for the duration of uh, GoTo, but also I'm on Twitter. Um, I blog occasionally at jeffreylessel.com, typically about Elixir stuff. And uh, I've got a YouTube channel where I start doing some live view um, stuff, mostly just checking to see if my setup here works. But I think I'm going to continue doing that. And of course, this project repo.
is down here as well. Uh, so if you're going to go check out the code and, and try it for yourself locally and mess around with a little bit, um, then feel free to do that. Each comment uh, is broken out, or sorry, each comment is broken out into those little steps that we went through to, to change our application from a traditional one to one that handles live real-time updates. So thanks so much for coming to my talk.